our experience so slowly slowly they join yeah they keep on trickling in and i tried telling everybody to uh, come and know personally also i sent him the pdf uh, things sir we are live now so. yes i know thank you so uh, uh, good evening everybody and uh, i think since it is 7 o'clock uh, we'll uh, start welcome all of you to this uh, journal club and this on september monday first monday uh okay all right thank you so we will be uh, having a very interesting paper on embolic stroke of unknown origin and the uh, presenter will be dr anuja patil and it's from kims team and moderator is dr subhash kaul our chair persons are dr sunil narayan and dr uh, anuja patil so uh, i hand over the proceedings to dr sunil narayan to conduct and along with dr anuja patil hand over to you sir yeah, thank you uh, <clears throat> so we have been uh, after the uh, covid uh, pandemic was over we had some uh, serious activity uh, we had the midterm conference and uh, uh, it was uh, uh, i would say uh, even though the uh, on site participants were only around uh, 120 we had uh, uh the a number of uh, uh, more than uh, 250 additional uh, the <coughs> uh, online participants also so all the uh, the entire program each and every talk was uh, very interesting and uh, very helpful in updating the knowledge of uh, post graduates and young practitioners and also each of us uh, i i got a lot benefited and the first time we had actually Uh, had a, a research section also uh, as a workshop which was free to all the uh, registered delegates so uh, all in all uh, we had excellent feedback about the whole program and uh, the other thing which we started this year uh, dr gorthi uh, had taken initiative for a, a journal club and uh, this uh, during in the, for this journal club we had uh, uh, this is the fourth or fifth uh, dr gorthi fifth one. Fifth one, yeah. So we had uh, one from uh, Jipmer, Dr. Rajeshri, then uh, uh, Dr. and uh, from Sri Chitra Tirunal, uh, Dr. Gorthi's uh, team from Bharati Vidya Peet, and then uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and then uh, the uh, uh, now it is uh, Dr. Subhash Kaul's uh, uh, team, uh, and um, yeah, uh, Dr. Kaul at Kims, as I understood the. Uh, Uh, cannot but have a very active uh, stroke group however much he says that he is going a little uh, relaxed uh, as long as uh, dr kaul is uh, at the uh, leadership uh, it cannot but be uh, a very uh, enthusiastic team i can uh, imagine a very good activity going on national board uh, so this time the program is uh, the um, uh, the uh, doc- dr Uh, Kirti Reddy is uh, presenting a very very important uh, article. Uh, we all know that uh, the Pakistan uh, inhibitors, the newer ones, are actually now in vogue, and there is a lot of uh, use. And uh, 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 perhaps uh, depending upon where you practice and what kind of clientele you have, uh, there is a lot of uh, use of these drugs. And this paper. Uh, throw some important insight into the uh, potential uh, of these drugs uh, as against the conventional aspirin in embolic source of uh, uh, embolic source of unknown source and um, uh, particularly considering the fact that this is a paper which has a lot of uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies sponsoring it the results of the study are a very uh, revealing and it shows it looks like i had done a, well uh, a good corner study of uh, uh, very interesting revelations so without much uh, ado let us uh, listen to this uh, very important uh, uh, article and i request uh, dr subhash kaul to uh, start the proceedings and to moderate the paper and i also would request dr kaul to perhaps uh, give a introductory remark on this uh, topic he always used to say 
uh, he, Dr. Kaplan, his uh, uh, big, he, his guru also, he, he sometimes says, the Kaplan nowadays would be considering himself much higher than Dr. Paul, I, I should say, uh, about uh, the mechanisms of stroke. Uh, Dr. Kaul used to say uh, the, he, the way he got fascinated and uh, Dr. Kaplan on this topic. So, uh, Professor Kaul, uh, if you could uh, just give an introduction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sunil. First of all, really on behalf of uh, our team at Kim's, we are very grateful, very honored that you asked us to participate in this journal club. In fact, I must uh, compliment you and Dr. Gurti, that you have rejuvenated this stroke subsection of IAN. And I know how, how painstakingly you do it. I'm a witness to that. You know, uh, otherwise, this was almost, uh, you know, it, it was not very active even when we were there because we went into that Indian Stroke Association. But you virtually make it, made it into a vibrant, very active thing. And we did that. Thank you very much. And um, today's topic, uh, which we have uh, chosen, is on a embolic stroke of uh, unknown uh, source or unknown uh, significance, basically unknown source. And this basically um, stems from the fact that uh, strokes have mechanisms. In fact, this stroke mechanism thing we have understood only in the last 20 years. When I went to do my fellowship uh, about 25 years ago, I used to think all strokes happen either because of atherosclerosis or because of cardio embolism. I did not know that there are so many other uh, mechanisms. And uh, in fact, I remember Dr. Louis Kaplan once asked me, what is the most common mechanism of stroke? I said, atherosclerosis. He said, go and read your Harrison. And what I found is that the most common source of, uh, most common mechanism of stroke is unknown. And it was unknown then and it's unknown now. And this used to be called cryptogenic stroke. Because uh, since many residents are here, you should know there's a difference between risk factors and mechanisms. Risk factors are hypertension, diabetes, homocysteine, smoking, but mechanisms are through the actual mechanism with which the stroke develops. It can be a large artery atherosclerosis in the neck. It can be large artery in the brain. It can be a cardioembolic because of a clot in the heart. So these all are called mechanisms. But then about 20 to 30% of the stroke all over the world, you can't identify the mechanism. And this used to be called cryptogenic stroke. But there were some limitations with the cryptogenic stroke, with the definition of it. One limitation of cryptogenic stroke was that in the definition, they said that if you have not investigated a patient completely, it becomes cryptogenic stroke. So therefore, a lot of contamination came into the data. From small, small centers, they would not even do an echo, they would not do a Doppler, and they would become cryptogenic stroke. Actually, they were not cryptogenic, but because of not doing the investigations, they became cryptogenic. And the second, another very, uh, you know, interesting uh, mechanism of cryptogenic stroke used to be if there were two mechanisms in the same patient, let us say, and it's very common that a patient is having atrial fibrillation at the same is having a carotid stenosis, they would say cryptogenic stroke, you know, actually it's got two mechanisms, but, but because of the definition problems, it would also be classified in the cryptogenic stroke. So therefore there was a lot of contamination into the data. I did not. The, the, the existing data at that time, over 15 years ago, it did not reflect the truth as it is. So therefore, this new term was born, embolic stroke of unknown source, where we assumed that it's embolic, and it was assumed that probably cardioembolic, but could be other emboli also. And this is how this term came, ESUN. And there were some criteria, which we are going to discuss now. But the most important question in this was that how to prevent stroke if you have got a ESUS? How to prevent it? Usually, aspirin is the standard medicine, default medication for all strokes. But the question was raised because these are embolic strokes. These are non-lacunar strokes. They probably might benefit from anticoagulants. Neurologists have always been fascinated with anticoagulants, like from Louis Kaplan, who used to give you know, warfarine right and left. So therefore it was thought that probably anticoagulants may benefit these patients more than uh, antiplatelets. So then two trials were done uh, in this ESUS group. One was called RESPECT uh, ESUS and one was NAVIGATE ESUS. Both of them, they used NOVAX. 
in the respect uh, they use dabigatron and here in the in the navigate trail they use the rivaroxaban and this that is what we are going to discuss today in this uh, in this in this uh, today's paper actually today's paper is a exploratory analysis this is all based on the data which was collected in the main trial which was navigate isas and all the data sets of the navigate isas were finally used this is also i think dr gorty is an expert this is also one way of doing research that all the data sets were obtained by a certain set of investigator and then they posed their new research questions and again worked statistically around the data which was taken from navigate and essentially the the, the navigate trial was a negative trial because the question in navigate was that rivaroxaban is superior to aspirin because they are thought to be so called embolic it was negative so then the question was that maybe they may be helpful in some particular subset of is because is is also a subset could be because of heart it could be because so they looked at these different subsets and that is what we are going to discuss this exploratory uh, analysis this evening so with that it's my pleasure to invite our today's presenter dr kirti reddy in fact dr kirti reddy is a very young uh, energetic uh, student she has just joined dnb only 2 months back but in these 2 months she has been extremely good and when this offer came i immediately uh, invited her to take and she was quite enthusiastic this is her first presentation and i'm sure she will do well and we are all there to interest with you on this important topic so over to you kirti okay, thank you sir A good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Kirti from Kim's Hospital, Secunderabad. Uh, I thank Indian Academy of Neurology (IAN) Stroke Subsection and all the dignitaries over here for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present this uh, journal. Today, I am going to present uh, this study. Um, Uh, this is uh, my title of the study is the potential number source in the outcomes in embolic stroke of undetermined source in navigate isas trial and coming to the background and the purpose of the study the isas is a term coined in 2014 it's a non lacunar ischemic stroke with embolism as a likely mechanism it represents around almost around 17% of all the ischemic strokes and a considerable rate of stroke recurrence of about 4 to 5% per year has been observed out of which almost 90% or all patients are already on antiplatelets in this subset of the patients of isas there is a, a consideration whether anticoagulants are more efficacious than antiplatelets in this uh, subset and navigate is a trial it's a article it's a uh, original article was presented in mgm in 2018 and uh, it is an international double blinded randomized phase 3 trial it's a new approach rivaroxaban inhibition of factor 10e in a global trial versus asp uh, aspirin to prevent embolism in uh, stroke of undetermined source where they have compared the uh, rivaroxaban 15 mg once daily with the aspirin 100 mg once daily in pa uh, patients with the recent isas and the hypothesis of this trial is that anticoagulant treatment with rivaroxaban is superior in preventing the stroke recurrences in patients uh, with isas uh, and when compared to the patients treated with aspirin and coming to the criteria for the isas there are four criteria for uh, considering the patients as a uh, and it should be an ischemic stroke treated by either a ct or mri and it should be a non lacunar stroke and there should be absence of any extracranial or intracranial atherosclerosis causing more than 50% luminal stenosis in arteries supplying the area of ischemia and there should not be any uh, major risk cardioembolic sources of embolism and also there should not be any specific cause of stroke identified such as arteritis dissection migraine vasospasm or drug abuse and coming to the sources of embolism the potential sources of isas there are seven sources have been studied in this study and these are atrial cardiopathy covert atrial fibrillation left ventricular dysfunction arterial atherosclerotic disease patent foramen uve cardiac valvular disease and cancer 
and the study objectives of the navigate thesis or the primary efficacy objective is whether river of sepal is superior to aspirin in reducing the risk of recurrence of stroke in patient with the recent thesis and the secondary efficacy objective is to see whether river of sepal is superior to aspirin in reducing cerebrovascular events cardiovascular events and mortality in patients with the recent thesis the safety objective of the study is to see the incidence of the clinically relevant bleeding among the two group and this is a schematic study design where around 7000 uh, subjects were randomized in a one is to one ratio to either a rivaroxaban group or a aspirin group and they were followed up treatment and followed up uh, follow up was done and coming to the eligibility criteria the inclusion criteria is the patient should be of the recent ases they have taken the patients enrolled patients between 7 days post ases and up to 6 months of the post stroke ases and the inclusion criteria are the same as we have discussed for the ases and coming to the exclusion criteria they have uh, excluded patients with a severely disabling stroke with a modified ranking score of more than 4 four or more than 4 and uh, patients with indications for chronic anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy and the estimated gfr less than 30 ml per 30 ml and coming to the methods of subgroup analysis the isf is a heterogeneous population they are uh, and, and they have varying underlying many potential embolic sources so they have divided into subgroups to assess the prevalence of the recurrence mortality among the subgroups and for each subject in the study they have seen the presence or absence of the each embolic source and also the number of the embolic sources they have measured and this subgroup analysis is important to see the consistency of a treatment effect among different subpopulations of the eases and also to see whether any specific subgroups are more or less likely to benefit or harm from the treatment and also to identify patients at a greater risk of a recurrent stroke and coming to the definitions of each possible embolic stroke uh, atrial cardiopathy they have if any of the any of the following if the left atrial diameter is more than 38 mm in females or more than 40 mm in males and the presence of a supraventricular tachycardia atrial premature beats more than 720 for 24 hours duration and the uh, left atrial volume to body surface area more than 34 ml per meter square and the presence of a atrial fibrillation during follow up before primary endpoint and other sources are arterial atherosclerotic disease any of whether carotid artery block it's lateral to the qualifying infarct even if it is less than 50% stenosis if the block is there uh, it is considered and also vertebral artery block it's lateral to the qualifying infarct or a presence of a aortic arch block seen on a transesophageal echo and the next one is the left ventricular dysfunction here they have any of uh, moderate to severely impaired left ventricular global contractility or presence of regional wall motion abnormality or diastolic dysfunction or a heart failure history and also with the left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35% uh, they have taken and the cardiac wall disease if uh, they it's a source if any of the there is a presence of biotrophic heart wall or mitral valve abnormalities like moderate to severe mitral annular calcification moderate to severe stenosis or regurgitation valve thickening or valve prolapse and aortic valve abnormalities also and the other source is the patent foramen ovale is detected either by trans thoracic echo or trans esophageal echo and the present history of the cancer at baseline excluding skin cancer these are the various definitions given for the various uh, potential embolic sources in this study and the outcomes of the interest me- seen measured out uh, ischemic stroke recurrence alcos mortality cardiovascular mortality and mi and ischemic stroke recurrence was defined as a uh, focal neurological deficit of sudden onset it was due to the presumed arterial occlusion persisting for more than 24 hours and without evidence of a primary hemorrhage on brain imaging if the neurological deficits lasted for fewer than 24 hours there should be an evidence of the brain infarct in the brain imaging and coming to the statistical analysis this is based on an intention to treat population and the patient characteristics they have seen used proportions for the discrete variables and means with the standard deviations or medians with the interquartile range for the continuous variables and the time to take given data was represented with the annualized rate number of events divided by patient years of exposure and displayed using kaplan meier curves and the risk of each endpoint they have given hazard ratios with a 95% confidence intervals uh, based from the cox proportional hazards model 
and the independent risk of recurrent stroke and mortality for each potential embolic source has been measured and also the data were analyzed for the number of potential embolic sources any missing data was assumed to be a null case uh, that is no disease and coming to the results a total uh, before of result uh, dr kaul uh, yeah before result just a clarification yeah please i think the uh, es uh, uh, esus uh, in the definition usually the major risk uh, cardio embolic uh strokes are uh usually excluded uh i think in this paper also uh when they define it they are telling the so what what all uh, the question to dr kirti what all will come under the major risk cardioembolic uh, source uh in they are actually excluded the have- uh, in the study so that's why uh, Yes, uh, it could be interesting to it might make some impact on the uh, which we work which we yeah means the established uh, causes which are major... already there they have been excluded which are those yes yes and here the major sources of embolism seen in eses population it is of no, no. Mm-hmm. kirti what what neil is asking is that because you you said that the usual and the major sources of cardioembolism were excluded in this patient Yes. So, which would be those? Those would be, you know, some, something like established uh, persistent atrial yeah. fibrillation mm-hmm. or rheumatic heart disease with mitral stenosis and those which are already established, right? Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, these are the patients. Uh, these are the some uh, sources of embolism which were not diagnosed at the time of evaluation with the basic evaluation. these were not diagnosed and we were not able to find the source of the embolism if there was an evident uh, atrial, uh, atrial fibrillation or a presence of a clot and all they were not considered as the eses there on the later evaluations if they were find out any cause further causes then they have classified as the potential embolic sources or further evaluation if the basic evaluation does not provide any uh, sources of embolism they have considered it as a eses embolic so stroke of undetermined source sir so in cardio embolic sources in cardio embolic sources if we look in the books also there are strong cardio embolic sources like clot in the heart uh, like atrial fibrillation like a mechanical heart valve like a rheumatic heart uh, disease rheumatic heart valve they are all high risk embolic sources rest all are uh, medium risk embolic sources which are not taken into as established cardiac uh, so they do uh, and they are also when it comes to the arteries the carotid and vertebral more than 50% more also than 50%. excluded yes, yeah. Sir. Yeah. 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 excluded sorry yeah excluded sir more than 50% have been excluded yes. to clarify uh, for you got an external loop recorder which is recording for 7 days or internal loop recorder which is recording for 3 months you get a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation that becomes an aces yes. yes sir Yes. If the prolonged monitoring picks it, uh, it could be classified as a source in ACEs. Yes. yes. Right. Continue. Continue. Yes, Coming to the results part, a total of seven thousand two hundred and thirteen subjects were enrolled into the study at four fifty nine sites over thirty one countries between December two thousand fourteen and September two thousand seventeen. This is for the navigate ACEs. And the three thousand six hundred and nine patients uh, were under the river oxaban group, and three thousand six hundred and four were under the aspirin group. And the median follow up of the patients was around eleven months. And uh, because the trial was terminated early because of a lack of benefit with the recurrence of the stroke, and also because of the bleeding associated with the river oxaban group. And there were in around twenty three percent of the patient subjects there was no. or no potential embolic source couldn't be found out and the single source was seen in around 36% of the subjects and multiple that is more than two sources potential embolic sources were seen in 41% and more than in around 15% of the patients they had more so, than three so kirti kirti just for uh, for a reemphasis can you just uh, once again show us the slide of these potential embolic sources because this whole paper is about these potential yes. embolic sources where they are assuming that these are the potential embolic sources there are actually in the if you see the eses literature there are almost 50 potential embolic sources but wow. in this study they have taken the seven most important embolic sources uh, which are coming in eses so in that first is atrial cardiopathy second is covert covert means paroxysmal af 
third is left ventricular dysfunction fourth is arterial atherosclerotic disease less than 50% this would be less than 50% yes, sir. Yes, more sir. than 50% will come in the convention then patent forum and oval then cardiac valvular disease uh, but this cardiac valvular disease will not be the mitral stenosis and all this is bioprosthetic valve uh, you know and uh, cancer Calcification, um, also some yeah. valve calcification. So, so actually, it is driven largely by cardiac sources. So that was that is another reason why they thought that rivaroxaban may be helpful in these. That's why they thought. That was the that is the hypothesis that these are mainly driven by either hypercoagulability or the cardiac sources. That's why cancer is also there. Uh, patent foramen oval is there. Left ventricular dysfunction (AF) only one non-cardiac is there. Atherosclerotic disease. So that is the, the how they develop the hypothesis that maybe anticoagulants are better. Okay, go ahead. And that uh, left ventricular dysfunction subgroups and arterial yeah. cardiopathy subgroups are also very educative. Very yes, sir. Yeah, we, yes, sir. I think as practicing uh, stroke patients, it should be at the uh, readily in our mind. So it helps us. Go ahead. Go Especially ahead. ejection fraction less than thirty-five percent, where you got to give Novax is a good point or oral anticoagulation. In any past history of LV left ventricular failure and uh, diastolic dysfunctions, uh, we know all these things, but they nicely do teach. But are Subhash, six and seven are overt already. Do we uh, consider them as ESAs? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, see, uh, you see, 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 Dr. Gorthi, this is very interesting that ESAs evaluation uh, does not uh, include uh, 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 TEE. TEE mm. is to be, yeah, it, it includes oh, only okay. 2D echo. So it yeah. is possible if you have done 2D echo, you have done carotid Doppler, you have done MRA, your all investigation may be normal. It's only TEE which will okay. show you for patent foramen oval or TCD which may show you. Uh, so it is still coming as one of the causes of um, ESA. But how about valvular disease? Valvular disease is evident, isn't it? Yes, this valvular disease, uh, no, no, I'll tell you what about valvular disease. This is very interesting. This uh, normally should not have been in the in the ESS criteria yeah. because yeah, bioprosthetic yeah. heart valve is very well established as a, yes. a yes. cardioembolic source. Uh, this uh, calcification is a weak uh, cardioembolic source, but uh, moderate to severe rheumatic stenosis uh, also. This is a this this is a very established. This should not be in the ESS. I was wondering why it is in the ESS, but uh, probably because this may be a very uncommon disease in Western country, and therefore they thought it very rare that could be. And cancer also is you won't uh, go back and diagnose cancer after a stroke. It is already there. Is already in treatment, and uh, there may be stroke. Yeah, but sometimes sometimes they are saying that in if you don't find any etiology in in a stroke, you have to do uh, you have to do you have to search cancer actually. Okay. This, this, this is one. Okay. That's why D, before COVID came, mm. in ESS one of the investigations proposed was D dimer. Like Shri mm. Shastak gave a lecture many years ago. Uh, in Pune, and uh, he said that you should do D-dimer uh, because that would tell about the underlying cancer. But in our practice, we don't see very often uh, yeah. cancer as a cause of ESS, but uh, is given there. Interesting. But, but I completely agree with you, Dr. Gorti, that these valvular diseases uh, should not have been in the ESS, but somehow they have given it here. Yeah. yeah the other interesting thing is uh, here the atrial fibrillation is uh, uh, only on... Uh, no Holter has been uh, insisted upon on the diagnosis. So uh, whatever presence with AF evident on ECG, I think that's what they have uh, taken as AF based, uh, AF at baseline not meeting st uh, study exclusion. Uh, le less you, than Kirti, have they done Holter? I think they have done for limited yeah, time. They have done Holter monitoring. It's a baseline a Holter monitoring was done, but a prolonged Holter monitoring was not a prerequisite for the diagnosing assets. Okay. So all, all included patients uh, have been subjected to Holter. Yes, sir. Holter monitoring, uh, CT or MRI and ECHO has been done in all the subjects. Sir. But uh, but Sunil, uh, you're right. Holter, they have not insisted on prolonged Holter monitoring. Yes. yeah. I, I mean, we always do at least two weeks or sometimes recommendations say you can go even beyond up to three months or more. But yeah. they have done limited, as, as I was reading. And the yield there. keeps changing 24 hours, 48 yeah. hours versus... 20, hours. 20 hours was a basic prerequisite. Beyond that, it was up to the like 
the treating physicians some of them have underwent prolonged recording but how long and how much of proportion patients underwent that has not been no, there are a couple of trials where they said three and six months are implantable uh, loop recorders no. yeah. yeah but in this study 20 hours minimum they have done so yeah. that's uh, good enough yeah. 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 yeah okay keep the continue i think yeah continue okay. yeah. and uh, uh, this is a percentage of uh, presence of the pot uh, potential embolic sources in the subject population and the mean age prevalence of hypertension dyslipidemia coronary artery disease and peripheral artery disease they tended to increase with the increasing number of the potential embolic sources as expected and uh, these the three most prevalent potential embolic sources observed are atrial cardiopathy left ventricular disease and arterial atherosclerotic disease among the seven studied and the recurrent ischemic stroke occurred in around 156 patients in the river of the band group and in 153 patients in the aspirin group and the annualized rate is almost the same among the two groups and coming to the major bleeding it was observed in 62 patients in the river of the band group and in 23 patients in the aspirin group and here we can clearly see that the hazard ratio is 2.72 and with the p value is significant it clearly signifies that the risk of major bleeding is definitely more the, in the river oxaban group and coming to the baseline characteristics of the patients according to the potential embolic sources the mean age also almost similar except in the patients with atrial fibrillation we, uh, if i could just interrupt do we have any data on this bleeding uh, how many of them are fatal bleeds any yes, information sir. is there go back go back kid yes sir previous slide oh. previous slide uh, one more Uh, this is the uh, table they have given um, for the major hemorrhagic events, sir. I, among the, this is the number of uh, patients allocated to each potential embolic sources and the major uh, hemorrhage risk. Uh, this is the actual number. In the group under the atrial cardiopathy, it was observed with 30 patients and atrial fibrillation group, 7 patients, arterial atherosclerotic group, 25 patients and 30 patients with the left ventricular disease. Here it shows that the percentage of the bleeding is more in the river oxaban group when compared to the aspirin group. And the hazard ratios are also significant high. And this is according to the number of the potential embolic sources. They have yes, seen, uh, whether they were symptomatic uh, hemorrhages or whether yes, sir. Or what percentage uh, of mortality, any such How did they define major hemorrhage? That's the idea. Yeah. Major hemorrhage they have the as a uh, in presence of intracerebral bleeding and loss of hemoglobin of uh, more than 5% and also requiring hypotension and requiring vasopressor support. And uh, uh, these are the major criteria they have given as a major uh, hemorrhage event. They have defined as such. Yeah, because this is important because it shows significantly uh, worse for the river expand group. Mm -hmm. But uh, how much was the uh, long-term impact of it? Yes, sir. Really, due to uh, lead to significant hemorrhages and significant disability, or did it contribute to any mortality? So, it was, uh, yeah, I, I think it might be uh, available only if you go to the intimities of the data. Uh, we will leave it here right now, and then we, later on. But what is interesting is that in the arterial atherosclerotic disease, the hemorrhage is much more than than the cardiac uh, group. No, it's seven point four. Mm. Hazard ratio, they very high. So yeah, okay. Go ahead, Kitty. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And coming to the baseline characteristics, the age of the population uh, subjects was almost similar, except except in the patients with atrial fibrillation, cancer, and with the more than three uh, embolic sources, they were uh, patients were a bit older age. And the risk of sm current smoker status was more in patients with the arterial atherosclerotic disease. And the prevalence of the hypertension and diabetes is less in patients with the PFO. And uh, the peripheral arterial disease association is more in patients with the arterial atherosclerotic disease. And uh, this is the same thing represented. And coming to the outcome events in the Navigate thesis trial. So one minute, and, uh, one minute, one minute, uh, one minute. Uh, one yes, minute uh, if you, can you go back to that last, last uh, slide? This one. This, yeah. No, the last one, the one which you showed the various uh, potential sources of embolism. The one which you just now showed, the separate columns. Uh, next, 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 
Next. 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 No, the in which there are those seven different results, no, uh, just now showed. In which the NIHS is given, and in which the oh, yes, this one. This no, is this one is. I think we were discussing it in this afternoon as we were looking. There are two very interesting things in this. This is basically a snapshot view of this whole study, in which we are seeing these uh, seven uh, potential sources of embolism. One is that as we notice that the mean age is high, and one of the reasons for that is that the inclusion criteria in this study was more than fifty years. Uh, for some reason, they have not selected it. Uh, less than 50%, they were excluded. That we will do in our discussion. So this study has been done only after 50. And second is that uh, they have done it in non-disabling strokes. They have not done in disabling strokes. So less than four NIHS they have done. So therefore, if you see NIHS score in most of them, it is uh, less only, it's not more. And that is because of their inclusion criteria. And, they, and, and all the lacrimal strokes are naturally excluded also. Lacanar strokes are also excluded and not, they have to be non lacanar because they are e yes. yes. But yes. out of non lacanar also, they have taken the milder yes. ones. Yes. And uh, Anuja, there was a reason for that you were telling. Uh, One point, uh, sir. That, uh, less than four was um, MRS scoring. So this is at the time of inclusion. Any patient who has modified Rankin scale of, uh, scale of below four were included into the study. And the NHSS was calculated at the point of randomization. It, this is not at the his stroke onset. So all this, like all of them had been non-disabling. By the time the patient was enrolled, it could be zero to almost six month post the stroke. By the time of enrollment, however, the NHSS had been come down to one. The interquartile range itself is one to two. So the MRS is four. At, uh, MRS is less than four. Less that than the, four. Less yeah, than four. Yeah. But there are severe four. cases there now. They could have been severe, but at least NHSS doesn't reflect it. So oh. how many patients uh, had actual disabling stroke at the onset and by the time of randomization they had improved, we can't predict. Maybe one reason behind this was that uh, since uh, it is like prerequisites because we are putting them on anticoagulation, the chance of bleed should be less. So recruitment of non-disabling strokes. Yeah. Yeah. ESAs generally are also are having a low, uh, they are milder strokes compared to the non ESAs strokes. But, then in the, but in, in their inclusion, they have also made sure that they take milder strokes. So these results will be applicable to milder strokes only because that has been there. Those are the patients which are included. Yeah. Okay. okay, go ahead, please. Uh, coming to the recurrent ischemic stroke, this is uh, studying the outcome, uh, outcome of interest. Uh, recurrent ischemic stroke by the potential embolic sources. And the recurrent, uh, recurrent stroke occurred in around 309 patients overall. That comes up to 4.6% per year. And the lowest risk of recurrence was seen in patients with the AF and PFO. And the highest rates were observed in the patients with cancer, arterial atherosclerotic disease, and cardiovascular disease. And the annualized rate, rates of stroke recurrence for each potential embolic source were similar among the rivaroxaban versus aspirin assigned patients. Except in cases of cardiovascular disease, the risk of recurrence was marginally higher in patients with the rivaroxaban group when compared to the patients with, uh, treated with aspirin. And also the risk of ischemic stroke recurrence did not increase uh, with the increasing uh, with the presence with any number of the potential embolic stroke versus without the embolic source when adjusted for the age, sex and the other uh, risk factors. Now here, when you say the lowest uh, uh, the previous slide, uh, can you just show the previous slide? Yes. Previous slide. This one, sir. This one, lowest with the uh, AF and PF. No, no, not this. Next one. Next one. Yeah. So, uh, lowest annual rate uh, uh, is for AF 2.5 percent. That that's slide. The one previous yes, one. Okay. Cancer and other things which you showed. Just before. This. Atherosclerotic. Just the ah, yeah, this yeah. One. ah, yes. This one. This one. So. Uh, this is a little bit, uh, to me at least, it's it's a little surprising uh, because this is uh, Western data and uh, uh, non-valvular AF and all are quite common there also. Uh, so, the uh, isn't it a, uh, is it expected or is it uh, a little bit uh, actually? Uh, actually, sir, the risk of stroke recurrence might be expected more in patients with AF. But here, when we see the actual number of patients, uh, absolute number 
of patients with atrial fibrillation is very less in this group in this subgroup so, but atrial cardiopathy has 2000 more atrial yeah. cardiopathy cases are more yes sir yes uh, 2000 and also per- in the af cases uh, which are not due to cardiopathy uh, long fibrillation type uh, maybe these uh, drugs are working well and preventing strokes yes uh, so the uh, af may be uh, one of the conditions where uh, anti thrombotic drugs are uh, 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 more preventive than uh, cardiopathy is etc isn't it because these are about patients who have had uh, uh, recurrence of strokes af is one of the uh, least common associated condition here so and uh, considering that they are all either on rivaroxaban or aspirin it yes. might also indicate the efficacy of these drugs in preventing recurrent strokes in af patients i mean that is sir but for uh, say fibrillation i think so that uh, overall the lowest rate was observed among atrial fibrillation patients yes. but in the atrial fibrillation subgroup also compared to rivaroxaban versus aspirin it is 2.5 versus 2.4 so both are same both are yes. nearly the same It's yeah, not like yeah, the yeah that's another thing that we will come to in the main this sure, one sure. so that rivaroxaban uh, i mean aspirin is as good as or even better no uh, aspirin uh, is actually more effective in the rivaroxaban yes. in this data yes. set yes and yes. that reminds me dr gorthi is a statistician dr gorthi could that be because the number of atrial fibrillation is less and it's a uh, that statistical yeah. error what I you can... call <laughs> ah uh, actually what that's a sample size is type less type 2 error <laughs> false uh, negative error ah uh, yeah negative error yeah. could be that ah uh, because number of cases of atrial yeah. fibrillation are less yes like, sir 200 but your cardiomyopathy i mean atrial cardiopathy are more number and atherosclerotic arterial disease are more in number yeah so yes. even then surprising is the high rate is seen in uh, overt mm-hmm. cases like mm-hmm. valvular disease arterial sclerotic and cancer then uh, that's what we discussed in this case all the three we can easily diagnose or they it cannot be issues in those we always suspect that it is it will be there if cancer is there as you say retrospect if we investigate for cancer and comes out that will be a surprise for us yeah okay go ahead kitty Uh, and this is the graphic representation of the cumulative recurrent ischemic stroke risk by individual possible embolic sources and as we have discussed the rate of recurrent rate, recurrent rate is more in patients with cancer and arterial disease and it is low with the patients in the atrial fibrillation and also this is a graphical representation showing the cumulative recurrent ischemic stroke risk by the number of the potential embolic strokes here we can see that it is almost similar in patients with even 1 2 0 or 3 the recurrence of the stroke has not uh, changed it is almost similar among all the four groups and coming to the next outcome and all cause death by potential embolic sources there is no significant difference in all cause mortality between the rivaroxaban and aspirin groups and around 117 deaths occurred in the study during the study population and it comes to 1.7% per year and the uh, uh, highest uh, all cause mortality was observed in patients with cancer and af and lowest in patients with the pfo uh, and the risk of all cause mortality for patients uh, with cancer was the higher than the other rest of the embolic sources even when adjusted for the age sex and the risk factors and this is a graph showing the same and uh, this is a by individual cumulative based on individual embolic sources uh, it's a uh, highest in patients with the cancer and atrial fibrillation and it is less in patients with the patent foramen open and it is based on the here based on the number of the embolic sources uh, the cumulative mortality risk is increasing with the number of the potential embolic sources and the one with the highest number Uh, shown in blue is showing the highest number of the cumulative mortality risk and coming to the next outcome of interest that is cardiovascular death and mi uh, it happened uh, actually the uh, actual numbers are very less even stuck out and the highest was observed among patients with the cardiac valvular disease and is lowest among the patients with the patent foramen open and there was no significant difference between the rivaroxaban and aspirin uh, allocated patients and the limited number of uh, events have uh, precluded additional analysis in this outcome of interest 
and outcome events by degree of overlap of the potential embolic sources the annualized event rates both recurring ischemic stroke and uh, all cause mortality tended to increase with increasing number of the sources and there is no difference between the rivaroxaban and aspirin assigned patients regardless of the number of the potential embolic sources here what is observed is with the increasing number of the potential embolic sources there is no increase in the recurrence risk of stroke but there is an uh, increase in the uh, risk of all cause mortality with the increasing number of the potential embolic sources and dr kirti the uh, yes, uh, with the permission of uh, dr paul yes uh, the uh, capture of events uh, what were the methods to capture the uh, all the events is it by uh, self reporting or there was uh, a very active follow up uh, or the clinic visit based or telephonic contacts what were the mechanisms uh, of event capture uh, the patient visits uh, first visit was at the screening and then randomization and at one month of uh, randomization six months 12 months and after that every six months they have seen a in in visit uh, in clinic visit and at three months uh, they have done a telephonic interview sir and also they have monitor whenever they have done this uh, they have uh, seen the they have asked about the vitals recurrence of the any bleeding recurrence of stroke any non other complaint and other complications even when non significant bleeding and they have all they been documented and these outcomes of interest were uh, measured and documented by a separate committee uh, that is a, a central adjudicating committee has been monitoring the event outcomes sir I think and the we, event capture were all finished uh, before the pandemic breakout. The, uh, this uh, study, this study uh, report was uh, given in 2018 itself, sir. Or, oh, okay, right. With the old publication yes, or something. Yes. Oh, right. yes. Sorry, sorry. So, um, I think uh, the uh, the best uh, uh, follow up uh, we have, uh, capture we have obtained, isn't it? Uh, in the uh, yeah, all the methods they used. Telephonic uh, contacts are only in those who did not uh, follow up at the clinics. Is it follow up clinics? Clinically, uh, so where I think so. Like uh, the stroke recurrence and all. I think ha kiti. They were at obvious like at outpatient basic visits, and only the treatment adherence was confirmed on telephonic conversation. Okay. Now what I am asking is one of the uh, problem that uh, I mean the 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 paper itself discusses is uh, low event rate and how that could have impacted the other interpretation. So uh, I'm just wondering, is it a is it because we could have missed events or uh, actually the events were uh, less? Uh, low? No, no, Sunil, the, the event yes. rate actually, if you see, is not that low. The annualized uh, event rate is about four point five percent per both. year. I thought that was not low. That is, um, yeah. The, uh, the the paper discusses it as a uh, in the final part of uh, discussions and all. No, I think they have mentioned the. Uh, uh, One point that we also suggested was that null case scenario for wherever we don't have the actual follow up that was taken as no disease, and another point like uh, for patients who ever had a recurrence. Uh, any kind of stroke, imaging was a must. But uh, if at all CT or MRI or imaging uh, evidence was not there, that recurrence stroke was taken as ischemic. So numbers could have been different, either bleeding or this thing. But overall, the outcome I think so was captured for all Absolutely. patients. Okay. Okay. It's nice. Okay. And this is a table showing that with increasing. Uh, uh, with increasing number of the potential embolic sources, the annualized uh, the all-cause mortality rate has been increasing. And uh, this exploratory analysis of the Navigate ESS cohort showed that over 40%, 41% uh, of all the patients of ESS had multiple potential embolic sources, and 15% of the patients uh, had more than uh, three, and 23% had no uh, potential embolic sources. And it also showed that it, there was no advantage by using rivaroxaban group in any group uh, when compared with the aspirin group as the point also the former uh, rivaroxaban group uh, if more bleeding was uh, seen and uh, without any significant uh, contribution in reducing the risk the recurrence uh, risk in ischemic stroke 
the rivaroxaban did not prove to be superior to aspirin and it also had a major bleeding risk as dr kaul's favorite uh, saying aspirin is the winner ultimate winner that's what dr kaul says always yeah i was looking at the previous um, yeah. journal clubs also there also that that was the theme aspirin mm. is the winner <laughs> so uh, can she go ahead with the critical appraisal yeah i think we'll yes. uh, we'll finish yes. yeah uh, is was there a clearly focused clinical question and primary hypothesis for this study is there is a focused question and or hypothesis and they have analyzed whether rivaroxaban is associated with the reduction of the recurrent stroke in patient uh, when compared to aspirin in patients with ess across different potential embolic sources and also based on the number of uh, sources of uh, um, based on the number of sources and as some ess patients uh, the embolism is of cardiac origin while other in others it is of non cardiac origin and uh, coming to that was there any clearly defined group of subjects in the study yes they have given a, uh, a standard criteria for uh, defining as eses and also subgroups they have a defining criteria based on the embolic sources they have defined and was a sample recruited at a common point in the course of the disease here they have enrolled patients with recent eses that these from 7 days post your stroke to almost up to 6 months post stroke they have taken the uh, enrolled the subjects however this is a huge time period as the stroke prone period is uh, and the risk of recurrence is maximum in the first 21 days after stroke when the sub subjects who were enrolled at the later stages that is after 3 to 6 months the recurrence of the stroke may be less based uh, as we know that the the risk of recurrence comes down you know after, uh, in the later stages so kirti one minute sunil what do you what do you think because don't you think that they are you know the, at the point at which they recruit is quite wide that window because some patient who are recruited at 7 days after stroke compared to some person who is recruited 6 months after stroke their natural tendency for recurrence will be different at 7 days after stroke you have got a very high tendency of recurrence by 5 or 6 months it's already kind of stabilized so we thought that that was kind of a limitation of the study that the window at which they are recruiting is quite wide and variable Yes. Yeah, that's true. And how much uh, follow-up uh, they waited for the stroke recurrence? Yeah, that that she is going to say, sir. So. Yeah. So, uh, to coming to the uh, uh, question that uh, Dr. Kaul uh, just raised, yeah. if at the time of say recruiting a patient at the six months, if there is a uh, clear uh, documentation that no recurrence had occurred. then uh, it might still be i mean uh, it could be okay so i am sure that they may not have taken the patients who have already had recurrences or are they uh, irrespective of any further strokes they have recruited patients 6 months post esus suppose somebody had had a stroke uh, then uh, could they have been still recruited at 6 months yeah because it's up to 6 months yeah so what, what i'm saying what i my question is suppose at 6 months if somebody had already had a second stroke after the uh, the defining uh, stroke then uh, would they still continue to that i don't know that that probably it's not mentioned in the study it is it mentioned would they take no, only sir. first stroke I or second stroke already recurrence they have not been randomized they have not been randomized sir they have not been randomized so that uh, partially takes care of that uh, problem of wider window but so, still so so my other my, my other this i was thinking myself i would like to your comments that when i'm thinking when this randomization takes place uh, in the randomization let us say some patient has been randomized who is 8 days after the stroke and he gets aspirin then the other patient who the next patient who gets randomized at about 5 months and he may get rivaroxaban Yes. so would that contaminate the results or if that will be equally applicable to both groups and they'll get neutralized uh, you know that's my will that favor any particular group uh, will, will that contaminate the results uh, because some yes. groups definitely there will be a difference uh, when uh, such thing is there so at the time of analysis they should do a stratified analysis at least yes. they should segregate yes. segregate yes. less than 3 months or more than 3 months some type of strat- uh, stratification has to be done yes Yes. Only one thing was that patients who had already been on anticoagulation were excluded. So, like what sir gave the. Sir, 
Yeah. So, Dr. Ilavarsi wants to say something. Yeah, she has a comment. Can uh, Can you Ilavarsi. unmute? Uh, can you unmute her? Yes, yes, sir. She's unmuted. Again, uh, can, can you please? No. Uh, yeah. Am I audible? Yes, 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 yes. You are. You are welcome. Yes. Thank you, sir. Sir, I would just like her to show the baseline characteristics table. Have they given us uh, the mean time to randomization? Because it is a randomized study, this uh, problem of uh, some patient getting uh, randomized to rivaroxaban at five five months, that uh, that might equally be applicable to the aspirin group also. Someone who came in at five months has an equal likelihood of going into the aspirin group or the rivaroxaban group. So since it is an RCT, that is not going to lead to any baseline differences. So, okay. but if we have this yeah. data, they must have definitely told us uh, what was the mean time to random. Not, not mentioned. Not this one. No, 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 not this table. Dr. Kitty, this is the baseline characteristics according yes, to the PDF, uh, but you show us the table one of the study. Table one of the results. Okay. Ila, but uh, all these patients would have been already started on some anti uh, uh, some secondary prevention drugs and it's uh, uh, it's likely more likely that they are on aspirin than on rivaroxaban so there is a uh, uh, for until a longer period patients could have been on uh, antiplatelet drugs in the rivaroxaban group were, that uh, is possible, sir. That is, uh, of course, it is possible. Patients might have been on aspirin, clopidogrel, or any other yeah. drug. Generally, after a cryptogenic stroke, people are on aspirin. But so uh, this a... study, in this study, they tried to find out after the after starting of whatever drug, aspirin or rivaroxaban, uh, future may be events were they try to study that. So, of course, uh, early two to four weeks. Might, might so, if you have a breakup of the mean time to Randomized aspirin versus mean time to randomize. We don't have that table. But that data group. is not there, sir. They that would have been helpful the too. Mean yeah. randomization was a uh, two year, and the last randomized patient was the uh, follow -up treatment was done for one year. But uh, there is a uh, no uh, information regarding at what proportion of patients were randomized at what the, duration. The randomization is done from seven days to six months. Any time yes, they could have uh, randomized. So yes. it's such a wide interval. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but we get the point that this uh, uh, mm -hmm. the, the the different time at which the uh, um, patient is recruited that will probably apply to both groups. Yes, but uh, as Doctor Gorthi said, a stratified analysis would be helpful in this case, time based stratified. Okay, it go may ahead. Show some difference. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, was the randomization process clearly described? Yes, they have a randomized uh, based on one is to one randomization. They have mentioned. Based on the country and the age of uh, the thing, they have randomized and uh, was concealed allocation used in the allocation of the treatment groups. Yes, they have uh, done a concealed allocation. How did they the do concealed program. allocation in this uh, study? Uh, um, they have randomized, uh, means uh, uh, they have done a double dummy, uh, double blinded study, sir. They don't know what drug they are on. Achha, a, they use the envelopes or A and B, they labeled something like that. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, to all the patients received two sets of medicines. Hmm. One is a uh, in a rivaroxaban group. They will receive one rivaroxaban 15 mg and then other uh, dummy tablet of the uh, looking similar to the aspirin one. Hmm. The double dummy is that each patient is double getting two tablets. Each patient will tablets. get two tablets. One will be the active drug either rivaroxaban or else aspirin and one will be a placebo so yes. each time patient is getting two tablets in an envelope so okay. one will be active and another will be a placebo and uh, regarding that previous question about randomization the original article i think so navigate is uh, which she showed in 2018 that gives the mean, mean time from uh, qualifying stroke to randomization and it is same for both uh, rivaroxaban is, ha, has almost like 38 days interquartile range and uh, aspirin group has 36. So there is no major difference between the time to randomization for both. No, there's a median now. Uh, interquartile range is median. Yeah. That means yeah, yeah. Uh, there will be uh, no unequal distribution. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's the point taken. Okay. And also, were the groups similar at the start of the study? And yes, the groups were similar in the age and gender. 
but as we know there is a is a population as such is a heterogeneous population and there are multiple uh, subgroups based on the differences in the source of embole and also the sample size was less in af subgroup due to the lesser duration of the whole term monitoring and also in the various subgroups they have mentioned as one source two source three source and all and they do, we don't know the, how they have the composition of the group and how they have and also the groups are like uh, uh, the atrial fibrillation group paroxysmal atrial fibrillation cardiac source non cardiac source and we don't know the composition and they might be under rivaroxaban group or aspirin group so there are differences in the among the groups and the subgroups in this study dr kirti i would just like to give one clarification if the uh, if the moderators permit me yeah yes uh, so go to the previous slide in this question in this critical appraisal question when you say were the groups similar in the at the start of the study you don't mean these groups of uh, cause of embolism or one or two or three ps that is not the question the groups mean the aspirin group versus the rivaroxaban group yes you're yes. discussing about an rct when we say groups what we mean is the various treatment groups okay yes. so these things are whatever you are saying one ps two ps these are the possible no. uh, uh, things that can be uh, the, these can be sub the effect modifiers they are subgroups they are subgroups, they are subgroups. subgroups. but that's in this question in this context group means aspirin group and rivaroxaban yeah. group so yeah. yes. 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 there are any there are between ha so they are similar yeah they are yes. similar yes. correct yes ma'am ha because you have some 7000 patients no when you randomize generally yes. all these things are generally taken care of Uh, yeah. in small sample size studies 100 200 you may find significant baseline differences yes ma'am correct and and the double blinding was used and it was used effectively and was the trial of sufficient duration uh, here uh, the trial was terminated prematurely due to the non effectiveness of the uh, uh, intervention and also because of the bleeding in the river oxaban group and uh, Uh, we cannot say it is a sufficient duration they found that the uh, the there is there not much effectiveness of the drug intervention and the bleeding was more so they have been terminated before they planned so maximum uh, how much time they observed that's what is uh, yes, the last randomized person was followed up to one uh, was given treated for up to one year sir that's a good uh, follow up is yes, uh, to treatment for one year and they initially they plan to see around the 450 events sir mm -hmm. uh, from, but the, before reaching that 450 events they have terminated the study sir so that was a uh, event driven this interim analysis 450 uh, events they wanted to observe at the time but the event driven trial event driven trial sir so was it uh, pre decided that uh, there will be a uh, interim analysis yes sir dsmb based uh, yes sir uh, possibly uh, dsmb must have interfered at, uh, at some time yes yes, yes sir uh, they wanted to do at a uh, 50% of that uh, event uh, events and also at the 67% of the pre uh, the events they wanted to do an interim analysis they plan okay. to do an interim analysis right Uh, was the follow up complete uh, here the so then it is uh, perfectly legitimate to terminate at that point that was a pre determined uh, decision and that was pa part of the methodology already planned so good yes right and was the follow up complete uh, the median follow up of patients was mentioned as 11 months which denotes some patients were followed for less than an immunization and the, they initially planned to follow for up to 2 years for each subject sir okay so incomplete so we think that the follow up is not complete and was there a blind assessment of the objective outcomes is yes, there is a uh, separate uh, committee central adjudicating committee uh, to see the objective outcomes they are the, they uh, they are not aware of the groups and randomization they will see as a they they were not aware of the which group the patient is under and they will assess the outcome there is a blind assessment of the objective outcome and so, uh, uh, i have a question 
the when we uh, prematurely decide to terminate a study that is only about the fresh recruitments no the follow up uh, falling short uh, what was the reason uh, they have stopped all the studies sir means even during the initial phase before stopping even when the patient has discontinued the drug or if there is any adverse effects which was which made to stop the drug but still they have followed up even if the patient is discontinued or the patient is continuing the drug but when they have decided to stop the trial after that they have not followed up so stop the trial means what stop the recruitment or stop the follow up the recruitment after recruitment sir after recruitment everyone 7200 uh, that patients were uh, enrolled at various uh, uh, randomization yeah, so though for those people one could have follow, completed the follow up no yes sir for a few patients they have received all the patient who were recruited at a later stage may not be follow up or may not be complete any data on what percentage the follow up was not completed uh that uh, So you had the previous slide, no? Some fifty-two slides. Yes, yes, yes I'm showing. Ah, uh, here it is there, ma'am. Ah, yeah, uh, yeah, this is how many right? patients at this time, right. and how many patients received the treatment, and who completed the treatment, and who have not completed the treatment, and also when the consent was withdrawn by the participants, uh, it was also mentioned. This Groups is have follow lost. Follow-up completed. So yes. for fifty-seven patients, they did not have follow-up in which group? Both group. Uh, this is fifty-seven is for the river oxbun group now, and, and the second is for the aspirin group. Fifteen other group also. So. so you have to tell us what proportion. This must be less than two percent. Thirty-five yeah. would be one percent. It is somewhere one point five ke aspas hoga. Okay. So, what was the original sample size that was planned? Initially, they plan to take seven thousand population, ma'am. Total. So they are both group. Uh, schematic representation. They have total. They wanted to take seven thousand. Seven thousand in each group. One is to one. Ah, uh, total that they have taken. Seven thousand in each group, na? No, ma'am. Seven thousand overall, ma'am. So what we started is yeah, perfect. Yes. Yes, ma'am. No, no. This is another one. They have recruited thirty-five hundred instead of. They plan to take. Ah, uh, they wanted 000. to take uh, the N is seven uh, thousand, and they again say each group they wanted to take three thousand five hundred. They ended up taking more than thirty six hundred. Yes, because uh, they they anticipated some fall off loss or if yeah. they not screening and all, so they have taken more than the subjects to uh, get this at least this number. So oh, we the have reached the pre planned sample size. Then why yes. do we say it was prematurely terminated? Uh, the fall of everything the study was uh, not completely done ma'am they mm -hmm. wanted to see 450 events after the recruitment uh, randomization total uh, annualized relapse rate type annualized uh, relapse stroke rate their primary objectives and uh, the hemorrhages the recurrence rate all cause mortality that events they wanted to see 450 event this is an event uh, based event uh, driven okay But so they have completed 450 they have terminated After that, I think they must have, uh, you know, stopped uh, asking them to continue taking rivaroxaban, and they could have gone back there yes. after they are out of the trial. No, uh, what were the total events captured in the study? Finally, four fifty. Did we did we reach four fifty? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, where? Uh, I don't exactly. Around some two fifty or two sixty, sir. I am not very sure. So DSMB stopped it because the. A, a little too many hemorrhages happening. Yes, yes. But so, there and there was not showing any benefit among the rivaroxaban group. Yes, there is no extra benefit by rivaroxaban. There is a oh, no. utility yes. as well as uh, uh, and safety. bleeding. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, were the clinical outcomes measured? No, no. Before, be, yeah, no, no. Was this the intention to treat study? Yeah, the... that's what the point. Uh, yes, it was an intention to treat. You said. Yes, it was yes. the intention to treat, but uh, it was because, uh, uh, it not mentioned whether the second one is not measured. No, it will be only for primary outcome. Intention treat only for primary outcome. Yes, sir. Yes, it's a superiority yes, trial. Primary outcome. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, the outcomes 
Yeah, I, I think. Uh, no, Doctor Gorthi. Hmm. One, one. I had one doubt that the patients who are lost to follow up in intention to treat analysis. Hmm. So, uh, what do you consider about the side effects, which in this case can, uh, comes to be hemorrhages? Could we assume that they had the hemorrhages or they had not the hemorrhages? Applicable to hemorrhage is not mentioned. Means uh, the outcome is not hemorrhage. Uh, we didn't. Not know outcome. That. I mean the adverse effect. I, if, if we have to the, see the adverse the, effect. Need to harm. That is harm to the uh, group. Yeah. But that's not the primary objective of this study. Primary objective is the recurrent of stroke. That is true. That is uh, true. Okay. So, that's a recurrence of stroke. So that's uh, intended treat is that. But I think the last to follow up is also very less. It's a pro you do a pair protocol analysis or a internal treat analysis. Both are uh, coming same answer. Then there is no difference because of the follow up last of last to follow up. So so, so Anuja, you are there. Anuja is yes, there. sir. So Anuja, uh, about that, uh, if there was a new stroke and CT scan was not available, then they would assume that it is because of the. Ischemic, uh, ischemic, ischemic impact, right? Ischemic. So, so, is, uh, so, Dr. Gorty, that is the right thing to do, or uh, because uh, no, maybe that, that was not, a hemorrhage? It could be, we, 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 but that is the limitation. Okay. That's a limitation in this. Yeah. Okay. Applicability. Okay. That is, you should ideally do a best case scenario and worst case scenario. Yes, the analysis analysis. should be done, but last to follow up is not that much, no? So, so uh, no, Dr. Elvarasi, I want to just um, uh, take your opinion on this. Yes, sir. In this intention to treat analysis uh, for the patients who are uh, missing, finally, you know, because of lack of follow-up. Yes, so, sir. So, so what do you assume the outcome to be in the patients as far as the efficacy and as far as the side effects is concerned? Do you think they had a good outcome or a bad outcome? What is usually done in statistics? So that is what, sir. If we want to look at the safety, efficacy outcome, for mm -hmm. example, if the drug, for, for example, this was a negative study. Yes. But for a moment, let us just imagine that Rivaroxaban was proven to be superior. Yeah. Okay. Then in that case, for example, if you have 100 patients who had, uh, who um, out of the 3,500, you had 100 patients who did not have the last follow. -up. Yeah. Then you assume that in the rivaroxaban group, all 100 of them had a stroke. Just imagine. Okay. Yeah. And in the aspirin group, you imagine that none of the patients had a stroke. Okay. For example, so if you find 150 patients in rivaroxaban group who had stroke and 300 patients in the aspirin group you, who had stroke. Yeah. That was the result. And 100 patients you did not know. Then you do a sensitivity analysis. It to a rivaroxaban mein jo 150 ko stroke hua, wo ho jayega 250. So fear me, मतलब we take the worst worst case case scenario. Worst 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 case पहले था साइड इफेक्ट और इन हंड्रेड में हंड्रेड में साइड इफेक्ट आ गया मतलब ये तो कुछ इमेजिनरी नंबर्स है बट उसमें आप वर्स्ट के सिनेरियो में आप वर्स्ट अस्यूम करेंगे कि रिवरोक्सेबन में सबसे सब में ब्लीड हो गया और एस्पिरिन में सब लोग बच गए हाँ तो उसमें तो इन्होंने फिर इसमें वो नहीं दिखाया हुआ they have not shown वो, that वो नहीं नहीं yeah. शायद की so so I, I and I remember one of the general clubs I have attended doctor I remember doctor Kamishar Prasad saying that they often do that somehow for hmm. some reason they often do that when it comes to side effects and all they but, they don't talk really, about whether the intention to treat was applicable to side effects or not yeah. but here for side effects effect, much of a follow up loss of follow up no it's only 1% yeah. your calculate. yeah yeah not much follow that's true yes yeah, that's, that's that's it's not very relevant here yes nahi sir hmm. but a 1% may be jo people who did not come for follow up might have might not have come for follow up because probably they died that is also a possibility. So when you are having very few event rates, just up to 200 patients, and you are 1.8 versus 0.3, aap dikha rahe ho, usme 10, 20 patients also can make a major difference. Yeah, but, uh, so I just want to know when they initially calculated the sample size, uh, the, we always make an allowance for the loss to follow up. So what was the percentage of uh, loss to follow up assumed at the time of initial sample size calculation. 
I don't know whether it's mentioned. Is it mentioned? No, actually, 3,500 sample size, but they recruited more than that, I think, 3,609 that they have catered for it. Yeah, so okay. won't that uh, take care of uh, the loss to follow up? Because yeah. we had but a... Nila's point, is, different. Nila's point is event rates are very small. In yeah. that case, even few things will matter more. Sir, here just one thing, like uh, we are worried about the loss to follow up, uh, but uh, total, I think so, the entire event uh, calculated had been somewhere around 330 around or so, when the target events to be captured was 450. So mm -hmm. if we have not waited long enough, few more events could have been like the recurrence. By the time the trial was terminated at only 11 months uh, instead of 24. Yeah. So that uh, duration could have mattered much more. Well, Possibly, yes, it is. It, it does matter. I think, Ila, what do you say? Yes, sir. It is It is possible that if you completed the study, maybe it could have been proven to be efficacious also. It's possible. 1% yes. loss to follow up versus 13 months of like mm. lack of time. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. so, when we have a fixed number of events, uh, then uh, the follow-up time is actually... Uh, variable, isn't it? We'll yes, keep on following right. up until that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Next. Go ahead, Kirti. Yes, sir. Applicability that. Uh, are our patients similar to the target population? Uh, and uh, coming to the recruitment, they have taken over from many countries uh, for the random. They have participated in many countries' population study. Yeah, not among them, and but the uh, countries or the parts. So we can say uh, there are some similarities and also dissimilarities among the population when compared to other population and, and the target population taken in the study. Uh, and also the prevalence of the rheumatic valvular diseases and all is more in our population when compared to the uh, Western population and all. There are both similarities and dissimilarities. Uh, that is what Even in our population, it is coming down, isn't it, Dr. Kohl? Yes. We are not seeing yeah. so many as we used to see earlier. Sorry, so, that, is there, yeah. so, so is there any uh, any insight on, are we like Americans or are we like Orientals? <laughs> Japanese no, I think, and Chinese? Uh, better, uh, uh, maybe hygienic conditions and preventive methods. We are not seeing so many RHDs as we used to see as MBBS students. Yeah, yeah, that is that is thing of past. Very few. No, Doctor Gorty, do you think that we are uh, genetically and pharma pharmacogenetically because this is all about pharmacogenetics? Mm. Are we closer to Caucasians as we would love to be, or are we actually closer to Japanese and Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> answer this question. <laughs> okay. But one thing is that there is an overall improvement in the prevention of rheumatic heart disease in India since so the time yeah, yeah. of 60s and 70s to this date. We're not seeing that there may be various reasons for an affluence in the society and development somehow over hygienic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, 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 I remember, I remember when we were... When we were MBBS MD students, there would be always four or five rheumatic heart disease, mitral stenosis, aortic regurgitation. Now, now we have to look for them to teach students. That is always the MBBS one of the examination cases. Yes, actually. yes, sir. At and I have one more uh, just point to add to uh, Dr. Paul's question. Uh, if we from the uh, India's uh, population's uh, ancestral inheritance, uh, by I mean. What the hist historical notes say that we are more of uh, immigrants from the uh, European population and uh, uh, part of, uh, especially on the southern side, maybe part of the Golconda, that is Africa and uh, Asia together. But the rest have already, uh, rest are all immigration more from the European side rather than from the Oriental side. So even though now as Asia, we think we could be, uh, we are different from the Europe and Africa and all. By uh, population immigration history-wise, uh, we have uh, less of connection with the uh, Chinese population. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah? That's, yes. I think Dr. Tangraj from CCMB Hyderabad, I, I remember one of his lectures, he also said the same thing. Yes. That we have European ancestry. I mean, it's very interesting. Yeah. Right. Okay. 
in the original study in fact sir they had mentioned that uh, the southeast asia population china japan and south korea they seem to have some lower stroke rates in among the aspirin group rather than rivaroxaban that was not statistically significant and the numbers have not been mentioned it's just a representative figure in the original nej article okay interesting okay, okay kiki, go ahead uh, are the risk factors similar to those experienced in our population is the common vascular and cardiac risk factors are similar to our but the exclusion of the less than 50 years sub subjects likely the subset of the embolic uh, embolic stroke and the lower prevalence of atherosclerosis commonly seen in our population if this could be missed out in this study as they have taken as excluded the patients below 50 years in in and, army uh, arena this is more common uh, younger strokes are more yes when i yes, worked yes. in army yes lot of uh, and, and not only in army i think it's generally the trend in india yeah, 10, in is, india 10, 10 years younger yeah yes yes, yes. and does the study improve our understanding of the disease or outcome as yes, it has helped us in uh, studying about the potential embolic sources of the eases and also potential overlap among them and also the risk of recurrence of the ischemic strokes and cardiovascular mor morbidity and all also we have we were able to study because able to understand better and summary and conclusion over 40% of all the patients of eases had multiple potential embolic sources anticoagulation alone as treatment for eases was not found useful it's not justifiable there is no addition because of uh, pes that's uh, one thing interesting even more number of cases same stroke very, very interesting yes sir and uh, overall there was no difference between the rivaroxaban and aspirin in preventing the recurrence of stroke in is among all the potential embolic source uh, subgroups a pfo was showed uh, showed lesser stroke recurrence with the rivaroxaban group and uh, rivaroxaban so, was yes, not yes hold on it uh, just hold on See, among all this thing this one was very interesting that there was not much difference between rivaroxaban and aspirin but in the subgroup analysis pfo is one group where rivaroxaban showed that it was almost double the benefit how uh, many cases of pfo uh, can you just check please how many cases of pfo can you yes yeah, she will check sir she will check. can you check how many yes sir uh, total number of 534 sir yeah and the recurrence rates among the rivaroxaban group is 2.6 whereas and this is the only thing where rivaroxaban uh, is uh, reducing the events because i'll tell you why i was just mm -hmm. telling them in the afternoon that um, we often say that uh, it is same antiplatelets or anticoagulants there is no difference uh, in fact i have stopped anticoagulants of many people and put them on antiplatelets but this study shows that they have a clear advantage but then this is only one study but that was interesting okay yeah, i agree with you that that's we have been having this concept so far yeah and now i think but 530 is a big number but this is not significant This is not significant. The hazard ratio and the confidence intervals. Yes, it is not uh, becoming significant, but it's a big number. Trend, trend. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. And rivaroxaban was not uh, superior to aspirin in preventing the recurrence uh, in atrial fibrillation subgroup. Mm, could be because the proportion of the AF patients was low uh, and likely underrepresenting this important subgroup. Uh, because uh, prolonged Holter monitoring was not a prerequisite in this study. that's why patients of the AF, we might we have this study according to as the prolonged studies uh, prolonged holter monitoring and loop recordings and all that and atrial view criteria data had a lower cut off range in study when compared to the other studies uh, so uh, diameter wise Uh, yes, here mm. they have taken this as 38 more than 38 mm in females and more than 40 in uh, males. But in other studies, in one study they have uh, sub-analysis of the navigate eases. Uh, more than 46 mm they have uh, taken, and it was showed around 74 percent risk reduction of recurrent stroke in with the river of Sevancher. Mm. And also the comparing the outcome. among the single versus multiple potential embolic sources without knowing the composition of the groups uh, cardiac versus arterial embolic sources 
could invalidate the treatment response so oral anticoagulations versus aspirin so generally when we diagnose atrial cardiopathies do they belong to this uh, uh, the range in which uh, the study is or arcadia type or arcadia type 46 and oh. yes more of arcadia type huh? yeah we uh, usually follow that okay yeah. so then uh, that will also be here yeah, they have taken 38 mm yeah Yeah, 38 may not be such an important cardioembolic yes. force, so therefore yes. it would dilute the. Effect. Yes, so that could be diluting the lack of effect of. Yeah. And uh, this merits the further research among younger population and also cardiac versus vascular causes. So the anticoagulant versus antiplatelet combination therapies could be tried. And also the uh, age of the subjects in this study were uh, below or uh, below fifty years. Uh, they have not recruited only above fifty years uh, age. They have studied subjects, and that is also uh, it's a limitation. And longer follow up could have better predicted the risk of stroke as well as the adverse events as uh, lay, was lay, as was later seen in the respect is a trial. ओके So, Doctor uh, Kaul, uh, I think you can give the comments, and uh, that uh, I think we are now nearing eight thirty. Time for us to wind up also. So, is this your last slide, Kitty? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, so um, I think uh, the what we have learned from this is that uh, in these patients of ESUS, where we are not sure about the mechanism. the study has shown that the indiscriminate use of anticoagulant is hazard and uh, in practice i see sometimes some neurologists doing that so that is uh, this clearly showing it can be hazardous and not any definite advantage for that and uh, the second thing i am uh, seeing is that you see when when there is a esus this study has shown a important thing and it has been seen in previous studies also there is a Athens stroke registry Athens registry of ESUS that is the biggest registry of ESUS so it's a greek registry athens registry in that they have shown that about 40 to 50% of these uh, ESUS don't have one ESUS they have three they have four and uh, it can be a random combination the patient could have a cardioembolic atrial cardiomyopathy at the same time it could be also a atherosclerosis less than 50% so therefore that brings to this concept of combination of using aspirin plus low dose anticoagulants as was done in compass study and there is a full paragraph in this particular trial in the article also that that may be something which should be studied more and more in this esus group uh, where we may give the advantage of anticoagulant to patients uh, but in a smaller dose so that we are able to avoid this bleeding which we have seen in this patient Uh, when we are very sure that this is the ESUS, uh, then there is not a problem. But many times we are not sure, and we are kind of shooting blindly. And particularly, we know that there are two or three of them. So overall, I think it was good, and I would. So, uh, so Dr. Yeah. Kohl, about that last point. Please. So, uh, if the potential causes, irrespective of the potential causes, mm. uh, there could be a case for. The uh, if it is ESUS, if it, there is a case for combination, is that uh, the hypothesis uh, yes. that they are suggesting? Yes. yes. Which uh, need to be tested in a yes, uh, it, it needs to be test. tested. It yes. needs to be tested. It was. Yeah. It was. There is already a compass study where in patients yes. with stable atherosclerotic disease, they have used uh, aspirin plus low dose rivaroxaban, two point five bd, compared to aspirin alone. and okay. they have shown that it is uh, significantly advantageous in preventing recurrence the I same thing is epic epic saban probably is it or uh, rivrox that was no no rivrox saban only rivrox saban 2.5 mg bd same thing okay right. and now it has come in guidelines also 
Oh. So this that thing has to be enlarged, particularly in this subset of patients. So, uh, so uh, Dr. Gorti, I have to really thank you because of you, three of us, myself, Dr. Anuja, and Dr. Kirti, have been talking to each other for the last three, four days. We have been talking of confidence intervals and so many things which we have never done before. So, thank you, Sunil. And I think you can give the final comment. Uh, may, 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 uh, Sunil, uh, just friend, we'll ask somebody from the group to ask any other part and all are waiting. So, oh, yes. can you ask them to? Uh, digital team, please uh, unmute them. And if anybody wants to ask any question to Dr. Subhash Kaul, please ask. Yeah, uh, Dr. Partha. Mm -hmm. uh, digital uh, team, please un un unmute all the participants and see if anybody wants to ask any question. Yes, please. Yeah. Or comment. Or comments, whatever. Dr. Partha is uh, unusually silent today. Oh, yes, Partha? he raised his hand also. Oh, okay. uh, Partha, I think, is not. Oh, is there? Dr. Partha, right? Partha, ah, right? He's there. He's Partha there. Right. Ray. Uh, digital team, but, can you unmute him? I think digital team is gone. We don't know whether they are trying to talk. Yeah, he can raise the hand, otherwise, he can put a chat. Uh, if uh, I think, uh, Sunil, if there is nothing, you do give your comments and wind up. Yeah, I think uh, I would, uh, uh, Dr. Anuja, my co-chair, please, uh, 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 your comments before we... Certainly, like uh, when summarized study and uh, although it was negative, means the result had been neutral, had been a good uh, learning point for us regarding the multiple strokes, uh, like potential embolic sources, subtypes and all. So maybe subsequently they'll come up with another post hoc analysis or another uh, neutral design wherein they can put in both the likely cardiac and arterial atherosclerotic uh, embolic sources separately and evaluate for the efficacy of both drugs or maybe a combination of both. But uh, as of now, well analyzed study. No, you can design a study and a uh, multicentric study in India itself and test the hypothesis what Dr. Stahl is saying that. Right. As I had suggested, like maybe Asian population is relatively more uh, favors aspirin yeah. group. So, good initiative at least. We can plan up another among us. Yeah, we, should, we should, we should, and as a team. Sure. Yeah, I think we should then uh, stick to aspirin rather than going for any other fancy. Yeah. As of now. Uh, yes, as, as of, of now. now. Yes. Sure, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Sunil, wind up then. Yeah, I think uh, we are not seeing any uh, questions from the audience. We, we have had uh, quite extensive discussion, so I think probably uh, most of the uh, questions uh, have been, uh, most of the uh, probable questions have been uh, discussed. So, uh, Dr. Kaul, uh, uh, we wish to, uh, I mean, uh, thank your entire team. They are very well prepared, uh, so uh, it was uh, nice to have such a uh, well prepared uh, discussing with the uh, well prepared. We also team. enjoyed very much. I want to thank Sunil you very much that you have rekindled in us research uh, spirit. It was, we really enjoyed a couple of days, Anuja, myself, and all reading about it and brushing up our concept. Thanks, Dr. Gorti. And thanks to Dr. Elvar. See, I mean, she's yeah. really. Oh, she's. very friendly. She's very friendly. So that's also very important. Yes, she's, very, she's friendly and very helpful, and we have learned a lot from. So let's keep participating in our journal clubs and so, so far. Please we'll uh, uh, keep joining and uh, please uh, yes. come prepared with the questions and discussions so that thank we, you, sir. Uh, thank interesting. Thank so. you, Dr. Gorti. Okay, Dr. sir. Thank you, Dr. Gorti. Nice. All. Thank and you. I, I, think, must, I must. I must say that uh, that uh, our resident dr kirti this is only her second or third year into dnb uh, yeah. i think she has really prepared well excellent and preparation really excellent yeah yeah i think uh, for your uh, uh, yeah it's it's really uh, i mean uh, they, uh, I, I can understand they are um, good teachers Thanks. and good atmosphere so and today i just want to say it's uh, teachers day so oh. i think we should uh, <laughs> conclude by uh, uh, paying our respects to all our teachers and uh, uh, so it's a good time to uh, uh, be amongst uh, students like Kirti and uh, uh, I think the uh, rest of us are all sort of 
Uh, all teachers. <laughs> teachers. <laughs> but we are all evergreen students as well. So Richard, before we wind up, lastly, please uh, uh, yes. circulate the Google form and get some responses so that we can plan. Oh, yeah. That's very, very important. Please, uh, thank you for reminding that. So that Google form, we would like to get response from uh, uh, all of you. And please do circulate it among all your colleagues, neurologists, uh, uh, especially those uh, uh, who are practicing neurologists of, uh, at any level. Uh, please uh, do get the response and ask them to join in. We wanted to do how the response differs from region to re region. But at the moment, we have only rural versus urban divide. Uh, data only can be collected, but it will be interesting to see how people uh, respond. Uh, so look for, and then we will share it here and then we'll take your input. We'll present in the IAN stroke subsection meeting the results. Ah, yes, yes. Yeah, we, there will be a presentation there and we can come back and have further discussions because it's important all these uh, things, how much it is percolating, how much it's useful, how it's relevant and how we can actually uh, uh, modified the atmosphere of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, the facilities available to the uh, people at different levels. So all the, these feedbacks are very, Not very only important. That, uh, the more stress on ischemic stroke has been now, we have asked also about ICH and uh, CVST. So there will be more uh, avenues for us to learn than only ischemic stroke, which we have been stressing in the last couple of Decades, I think. More we do more. have questions on CVST also. Yes, yeah, CVST and ICH. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then. Uh, okay, sir. Okay. Thank you. Good Bye. Night. Good night. Bye. Good night. I'll see you day. next month. Thank you. First Thank you, week sir. again for the next general club. Thank and you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye. Okay, then. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.